This is dead. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dead Air. Dead Air. Dead Air has two rules. No bad language. And only one call per show. But I want to serve up a very quick warning, and I really mean warning. Tonight is not a joke. Uh, some of the material in this broadcast may be very disturbing to some people. So be warned. This is uh, not happy night. Maybe some of it will be, who knows. Uh, but some of this material is scary stuff indeed. We're going to do some things you're probably not ready for tonight. There will be some stories from all of you, some that have been phoned in, some that will no doubt leak in through uh, uh, through Skype and other means. And, of course, our national number, we'll, we'll get to all that. I've got a couple of stories I want to read you first. This comes from a young lady. When I was 18... And I moved in my first place. My friends decided to show me the local cemetery at night after a hard day of hauling boxes. It was a large cemetery with old graves on one side decorated with statues on the other side, a lawn with headstones of veterans in the area laid flat in the grass. The six of us walked down a path that separated these two sections of the cemetery, admiring the statues and pillars to our right. We arrived at a low stone wall around a family plot and decided to get a closer look, wondering aloud if it was really a good idea to visit a cemetery in such a creepy, in fact, a creepy old cemetery at night. As one of my friends began reading the name and the dates on the headstones, another friend said, I think there's someone over there. So we all turned to look, thinking we were about to be ushered out for trespassing. Well, I looked where my friend was pointing, and beyond the graves of the hundreds of veterans who were buried there, we saw a dim light about a hundred yards away. In hushed silence, we watched as it moved closer. Soon, we realized this was not the authorities with a dim flashlight. As it moved diagonally across the veteran graves, we could see it was a gray human shaped figure. We began asking each other, do you see that? About 50 yards out now, I could see a solid gray figure of a monk, hood drawn over his head, rope tied around his waist, hands folded into his sleeves as he floated on his course toward us. The closer this figure came to us, the more details it could be made out in the dark as the monk appeared to give off a light of his own. I could see the shadow of a face under the hood, his knees bending under his robe with each step he took across the grass. Even the ends of the rope around his waist were swaying as he walked. I stared in disbelief, wondering what my eyes were truly seeing. I asked my friends to each point to it, to track its movement, to prove we were all seeing it. They did but they were growing more frightened by the moment. The monk, now about twenty feet away only, full-bodied, seven-foot-tall apparition, was going to cross in front of where we stood, as he did not appear to be changing the direction he was going. My friends all ran back to the car, screaming for me to join them. I stood, amazed, breath-held, blood-cold, and watched him slowly walk past me. He must have been five feet away, close enough to just walk up and touch. The details of his appearance I will never forget. He looked exactly like a Franciscan monk, but light gray and dimly glowing. My friend screaming for me in the distance, I watched him disappear into the rear wall of the brick caretaker house. This happened at the Greenlee Road Cemetery in Sonora, California, in the summer of 1994. That's from Heather. <laughs> and then I, I got this one, uh, and you should prepare yourself for this. 
When I was a young girl, and I was wild and crazy, up to things I never should have been, with little driving experience, not much sense, a little alcohol, a few of my friends set off, set off for a joy ride with me behind the wheel. Well, as the morning came, I dropped them off, and I was headed toward home, planning on dropping off the car somewhere close to it. I somehow ended up on a very busy street during a morning rush hour. My adrenaline, the alcohol, and a car I could barely drive, I hit an old woman who came out in front of a bus. So I stopped the car. The world spun as I saw her on the ground. I rushed over, and crying, I held her. I had no idea what to do. I kept telling her to breathe and that I was sorry. I could see people calling for help. I draped my jacket around her, and she died right before me, looking into my eyes. To this day, I've never forgiven myself for this. It's why I must write this to you. I cannot speak because I might break down. It was the most traumatic event of my life. I was charged, sentenced, and did my time. Many years later... I found myself living alone with a large black dog in an old house. I vowed I'd never do anything, any of those irresponsible things I had done, so I kept to myself. I had often felt very alone, very afraid of the outside world. Would sit and work on music or listen to you, meaning me on the radio. I would often have breakdowns of sadness and grief in my heart for what I had done, and I often felt like I didn't deserve to be living. One night I was feeling as such. I was sitting on the edge of the bed going through a box of my court papers, the newspaper article of the accident, and I broke down and crying so badly I almost couldn't breathe. I just thought it's time to end my life. But then I felt something heavy touch me on the shoulder, something leaning up behind me, holding me, a flash of this old woman's face. That woman I accidentally killed, but not in the way I had seen her on the street on that horrible day, but a gentle sweet lady holding me. And I was not scared at all. She comforted me. There were no words. I never turned around to see her, but I felt her, and I knew her for that moment. It seemed to last a long time. I felt like I had cried for years and years of sorrow, finally out of me that night, but I stopped feeling alone. For the first time in about ten, ten years, this experience has forever changed me and the way I see the world, people, and learning to forgive myself. I strongly believe that having such a traumatic moment like this sort of intertwined our spirits for some reason, and I have no idea what that reason is. But not a day goes by that I don't think of her or those moments. That's a couple to uh, just sort of start us off. I, uh, I've i got a couple of people on the phone. It's going to be a difficult night because I'm going to be like a one-armed paper hanger. We've got a very great deal to do. Coming up in a moment, Barbara Macbeth. Uh, has She's actually independently researched and studied spirit and ghost phenomena for over 50 years. She has conducted lectures, presentations, conducted ghost tours at locations where the ghost phenomena has been experienced by many different people over many years. She's also been a co-spokesman on behalf of the Ghost Investigators Society. You know them well in a USU documentary on television and radio. Barbara will be with us alone tonight. You will hear things you have never heard before. Only perhaps two or three of the ones we have have ever been aired. Barbara's leery of anybody who claims to be a so-called expert in any aspect on the subject of ghosts and hauntings. She believes there are too many unknowns about it. Anyone can claim a title. She believes that a ghost is the essence or conscious soul of a person who has lived on this earth. A ghost had a physical body, but the consciousness continues after death. She believes that whatever kind of personality we have, while we are physically alive, continues. 
and is still retained after physical death, or at least fragments of it. The EVPs that have been recorded have every range of emotion and personality which clearly comes through those recorded strange-sounding voices. In addition to the fact that Barbara is with us tonight, I would like to point out that if you go to artbell.com, click on Barbara's photograph, several photographs gathered by uh, the GIS are up there for you to peruse. That said, let's take a very quick break, and we'll come back. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, this will be disturbing material. Consider this your final warning. I'm Art Bell, and this is Dead Air. And any sudden. Will you partake of the Welcome to Dead Air. Took a lot on the wild side of midnight. From the Kingdom of Nye, this is Midnight in the Desert with Art Bell. Please call the show at 1-952-225-5278. That's 1-952-CALL-ART. All right. Here's the deal. If you've got a really scary ghost story, call me. If you don't have a good scary ghost story, don't call me. If you've got a really good scary ghost story and it's short, call me. If it, if it goes on forever, don't call me. We we sort of need to get it on and get it off because we've got a lot to do tonight. Same goes for Skype, of course. Uh, so here we go. National number is 952-225-5278. That's 952-225-5278. Might as well upset somebody else's night, right? Um, with a scary story. and And then on Skype. You are welcome to join us, of course, as usual, in North America at MITD51. Download Skype. It's so easy. And then uh, go to the Add a Contact, and we are that ad. Put in MITD, as in Midnight in the Desert, 51, and then we'll be in your contact list, and you can call us. All of that said, let us first say good evening to Barbara. Good from, evening, Art. From the GIS. All right, I want to say something about the GIS. The recordings that you're going to hear tonight are of the dead, and it's very scary to hear, so um, so be warned. Now, these are gathered by a nonprofit group. What was a nonprofit group, the GIS? I don't know what its current status is, but I, I know it's still nonprofit, if not almost non-existent. Um, however, Barbara remains um, a key member of it, and I, probably one of, I guess, wouldn't you be one of the original charter people, Barbara? Yes. Yes, me and Roger um, and Brendan and Jenny, and we adopted Barry along the way probably into it about three, two, three years. Okay. Um you know, no matter what we ever do, we're not going to get a good phone connection. It's not bad, Barb, but uh, what, here's what I'll ask. Stay right up on the phone, okay? You got it. Right into the phone. That'll really help okay. us. All okay. right. So these are recorded at various locations, uh, ranging from what to what, Barb? Well, we have done cemeteries, prisons. Homes, businesses, um, everything. Everything. Okay. Um, what I want to do is try one very quickly and see if we're in business and it's everything's working as it should. So, tell me quickly about number one. This uh, first one was uh, recorded in Deer Lodge Prison in Montana. Uh, it was recorded by Barry. You'll hear a steel door creaking, and the EVP will say, help, I'm in here, 
and you'll hear Barry ask, anybody in here? Huh. Okay, uh, let's give it a try. I mean, that was it sounded like help I'm here. Is that what it was? I uh, we hear help I'm in here. Help I'm in here. Yeah, help I'm in here. Sure enough. Um I hate to do this because uh, but I have no choice again. Oh, God, no question about it. Um, so, I mean, what's the theory, Barb? Do you think that this man might have died in jail? I believe if he did not die in that prison, that's where he returned after he died. Really? I, I believe his his spirit is still in that prison. That's a creepy. Horrible it, yeah, it's a horrible thought is right. Uh, uh, in other words, you do your time, uh, and you do your time. Gee, uh, maybe, maybe he didn't do enough time, or he passed too quickly, so cosmically up there they made him continue to do time, huh? That might be just where he lived most of his life. That might be all he knew. Okay. I can't imagine prison being a very happy place in the first place. So um, it seems like, to me, this is my own theory, but I think that people return to locations that they haunt that they were connected to in life. All right. Well, we have a richness. Many of these not played ever on the air before from the GIS um, so let's quickly move on to the next one. Uh, you do the setup. Uh, this one uh, was pretty interesting. We had been told at the Deer Lodge that uh, there had been a riot, a uh, prison riot in the prison. It was approximately about 1959, and the warden had been killed. And there was two of the prisoners that was up in this prison tower, and... Uh, the uh, police, uh, sheriffs, and uh, people that were trying to get this riot under control fired a grenade up into this tower where these two uh, prisoners were that were hiding out, that were holding out. And while we were investigating this prison, you're going to hear Barry and Brendan, they were underneath one of these massive towers of the prison, and you'll hear Brendan... A remark, you got to think right here is where they brought those two bodies down from up there. Pointing, right. You know, he pointed up at the tower. And directly after that, you'll hear this EVP say, my 11th year. My 11th year, really? Okay. you got to think right here is where they brought those two bodies down from up there. Uh, my 11th year. My 11th year. Wow, that was um, very, very clear, very clear. And people should understand that um, generally that is an exception. What you're hearing in these clear EVPs is an exception to what you normally get. It's usually much harder to hear. Is that correct? Yes, it is, and sometimes they're so whispery. We we recorded so many that we are not able to use on a radio show just because of how low and soft they are. Right. So what we're going through tonight is from years past, cream of the crop, Never, most of them never heard on the radio, I would say. huh? Yeah, but I believe so. Uh, they, most of these have not been heard. Okay, let's go one more very quickly. This was also done in the prison, and uh, this was recorded by uh, Brendan. Him and Barry had entered into this main room of the maximum security building, and in this clip, you're going to hear Brendan say, I'm going to go see if the cell door is open. Uh, and go see if the cell door is open. He, op you know, he repeated himself. 
And right. as Brendan is walking to the cell, this EVP says, let me out of here. And there's, we argue on what it says. It either says, get me out of here or let me out of here. Let's let everybody decide. Here we go. I'm going to go see if the cell door is open. <laughs> I think it's let me out of here. That's what it sounds like to me. Let me out of here. Wow. Yeah, there's there's discussion between us on what it's saying. Um, it's, you know, you can hear something different, and that's all right. Um. It's just that there is a voice there that should not be there. Well, yeah, clearly. <laughs> um, some of these now were recorded on audio tape, and then, of course, in later years, you moved to digital. That sounded almost like it came originally from audio tape. From audio tape. Right. And I think it did. Right. Okay, yeah, so... time, it did. Yep. Yeah, so... I know how careful you all are not to have anybody else around. You're the most careful organization I know when you record these, sometimes leaving recorders uh, running for hours and hours and hours, right? Yes. And then you get more hours and hours and hours to sift through them and look for anything because at the time you're doing the recording, you don't know what you're getting. That's right, because you don't hear them at the time, usually. I mean, there's been occasions where we have heard the voice, and it just kind of throws you off. You're not expecting to audibly hear it. Right. And uh, so when, um, you know, you if you spend three hours on an investigation, you are using another three hours just to listen to your audio tapes, Another three hours to go through your videotapes. Hmm. Um, so there's a lot of time involved. I get it. All right. Very quickly, uh, before the bottom of the hour here, uh, there are some pictures, Barb. If they go to artbell.com and click on your picture tonight, uh, it will lead them to other pictures as they scroll down. What kind of stuff are we seeing? Well, uh, we call it Super Ecto. We were in a... Uh, a amusement park that's located in Utah, and we were in a pioneer village where they've brought in old buildings and old houses and stables, and there's no rides or amusement rides in this area. And uh, Roger took a picture of a buggy and stable, and that was the it was at night time. And uh, we call it a supercharged ecto. We don't we don't know what else to call it. Okay. Um, that first one. The other one is ecto. It kind of looks like a face. You can see eyes, nose, mouth, shoulder. You mean ectoplasm? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ectoplasm. Okay. And so it's a it's an actual spirit we're seeing there. That's what I believe. That something's starting to materialize and form. And then the next one, one, which uh, the next one freaks me out. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> we were uh, doing an investigation in a old building. It used to be an opera house, and um, that's now a restaurant. We were down. Um, we had gone down under the into the basement under the floor. You can see how the floor actually slopes down, like how the theater's floors go down to the stage. Sure. But uh, we were coming up, and Roger took a picture in the kitchen. And what you should see there is actually the stoves and the refrigerators and things in that restaurant kitchen. And there's these three figures. Roger calls them my three sons, but um, there's three figures there that shouldn't be there. All right. I'm not wild about it, but what a photograph. All right. Hold on, Barb. We're at a break. You've got a good long break. My caller's on the line. Everybody hold tight and be patient. We'll get this out as we can tonight. It's dead air. I'm Art Bell. Good evening. I'm going to warn you again, a lot of what you're going to hear is really going to be frightening because it's real. So, please be wary. Please keep the children away. And, oh, by the way, a hi to Bobby and Kagyan Dioro. 
way down in the Philippines. That's my uh, wife's brother, and I wanted to say hello. Now to the phones we go, and uh, hello there. Thank you so much for holding so long, and welcome to the program. Uh, thank you, Art. How you doing? I'm doing well. Um, right. What part of the world are you in? Well, I'm in New Jersey now. I just moved here. I, I recently retired from uh, Las Vegas Metro Police in July. Oh, oh you were one of ours. Yes, yeah, for 15 years. All right, so tell me what happened. So at the time, it was a few years back, um, I was working for a, a, a team as a saturation team, and we're two-man units, usually Metro's a single man. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were down on the strip working on a Friday, and it was busy, and we, me and my partner retired, and we just kind of wanted to go chill out. So we jumped in the car, and we took off towards Lake Mead. And uh, as we're going down, we didn't get all the way down to there. We got to about Boulder Highway and, and uh, Lake Mead, and we pulled off, and there's a road called Pabco Road, and that road actually goes all the way around out to the desert. Mm -hmm. So we pull off into the desert, and uh, we kind of just pulled around and turned the lights off and just turned on the parking lights and just sat there and started chilling out. Now my partner's sitting, I'm driving, and my partner's sitting there, and he's on his phone. And as I'm looking, just illuminated to our right, I see somebody walking towards us. And I said, oh, man, I, we just didn't even want to get bothered. So this person's probably about 25 yards away, and they're walking from my right to left. Yes. So I tell my partner, I'm like, hey, heads up, there's somebody coming. So he looks up, and we see as he's getting closer, we see a female, she's probably about 15, 12 to 15 years old, short brown hair, and she's dressed in like 1950s. It almost looked like a poodle skirt or something. It was kind of light mm. brown. And so she, now she's walking in front of us, and she's right in front of our car, and she's not looking at us. And then as she gets to about past my window, I look down, and she, she doesn't have any feet. And she's just walking by, but I can see her skirt moving. With no <laughs> feet. Like, no oh feet at all. God, I, pay attention to her. What is like, a, we you know, when a law enforcement officer sees something like this, what do you what do you do? Well, <laughs> well, my partner goes, "Is that real?" <laughs> I said, "I don't know." Well, I, by the time I turned the spotlight on, she was gone. There was nothing there. We're in the middle of the desert. There's they're not even scrub or anything. It was, it was like a construction area. I take it though she was close enough. You got a good look. Oh, I I, I could identify her in a lineup. And in fact, it was. And it, I'll tell you how, how busy we were. It was that happened, and we kind of just like, okay. I mean, it's, it's Las Vegas, and <laughs> we deal with that kind of stuff. It's kind of weird. Um, so, I don't want to think that, but okay. <laughs> well, so we go on about our day, and I actually kind of forgot about it because it got really crazy that night. Uh -huh. And uh, about a couple weeks go by, and we're in briefing. And they do electronic briefing where they show it up on the wall and, you know, they're going through the slides. And Homicide, Las Vegas Homicide, just came out with a thing where they wanted us to re review all the cold case files. Right. So they're coming up, okay, this week's this, this week's that, this week's that. And, I, and I'm, you know, nobody's really, you know, we're kind of paying attention. And uh, they popped this one up, and as soon as I saw the picture, I was like, that is, that's the girl we saw. Oh, my and God. I didn't, even, I didn't even read the rest of it. I, I was like, I know. I was like, she was murdered in Anderson. I know she was. It had to been near Boulder Highway and, and Papco. And I looked at it, and sure enough, that's that was her. When ha when had she been murdered? Did you obviously you looked into the date? I'm sure. Yes, it was 1975, and uh, <sighs> they don't know exactly where she was murdered, but she was found out by the Henderson Ponds near there. And uh, I guess she was last seen walking down Boulder Highway. Well, you, you know, uh, they do say that, you know, people who go in that violent way tend to be stuck here somehow or another. That, man, that's some story, brother. It was, and, and my partner happened to be off that night, and I, I texted him the picture of that girl, and he freaked out. <laughs> he, oh, my God. Um, do yeah. You, do you still keep in touch with your partner then? Yeah, in fact, he was just texting me, and uh, I told him uh, to listen. He's still active duty out there, so. Hopefully, uh, you won't have to go through a psychological eval after this, because <laughs> they're going to figure out who this is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they will. I so appreciate your coming on with that story, and I can understand why you'd be hesitant to tell it, and uh, you would never tell it uh, on active duty. No, no, never. <laughs> Wouldn't want to make out that report. 
No, never. I thank you, my friend. All right, Art, take T- care. Take care. Let's uh, let's take one more quickly. Hello there. You are on uh, dead air. Uh, good evening, or It's uh, Ed from New Jersey. How you doing? Hi, Ed. New Jersey, back to the East Coast again. All right. Good to be talking to you again, sir. Okay. Well, my story uh, takes place in the mid-'80s. I was about 10 years old. I was uh, at a buddy's house after school. His father was doing some yard work and uh, digging pretty deep for what he was doing. And he came across something, didn't know what it was, ended up being a coffin. A what? A coffin. A coffin. Yard. A there. coffin. Oh, now, this God. Was, this was the you know inner city in New Jersey. Homes were from the mid to late 1800s, early 1900s. So, uh, you know, they were small, it was a small backyard. So, long story short, with that, ended up being a, a toddler. They looked into it, the authorities. When it was done back 100, year, 100 or so years ago, it was done properly. Just nobody knew it was there. <sighs> what about six? Uh, not what I want to find when I go digging in my backyard. Um, no. so, so it was an infant. Yeah, I believe it was an eighteen, around eighteen month old. Um, I, sorry, I, boy. So, uh, I would assume all all you found would months. be all you found would be bones at that point, of course. Well, I wasn't there when I opened it. You know that the, the, the you know consider yourself away. lucky. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um, any um, activity at all after about, that? Yes. Um, this is what the good part of it is. Oh. Fast forward six or seven months, a new pal starts hanging with us. Hanging at my buddy's house again. You know, what happened in the past is distant memory. Um, and then one day, our new buddy says to my friend who talked to us, I didn't know he had a little brother. He said, I don't have a little brother. Yeah. And yeah, you do. He was just, you know, Peeking at me and waving from the top of the steps. Yeah. He was like, well, we thought, you know, this, and this kid, you know, we thought maybe he was joking around with us. You know, he never heard anything about the story. He was new to town, but his family was originally from the area. So every time we would be at the house, this one friend of ours would be the only one to see this kid. Well, one day, the kid's father comes to pick him up and says, you know, guys, when you hear a funny story, my great grandparents used to live here. They actually lost a child when he was about two years old. <sighs> so it was the one friend who was seeing this entity's relative, great, great, great uncle, or, or whatever it may be. You know, when we do these uh, voices of the dead, this GIS stuff, we get a lot of children's voices. Extremely disturbing. I really thank you for the story. That's. Uh, I don't know what to think about that, but it's a great ghost story. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care. Ay, 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 ay. Uh, let's, uh, go, let's go back to Barbara. Um, hey, Barbara. Those were great. Those Wonderful were pretty, stories. pretty good stories, huh? Yes. And the police officer, they... When they see something, I mean, they're trained to be very... You know, I mean, they're on detail. You know, that that's great. I wonder yeah. if he ever found the killer. I oh, that would have been a good, very, very good question. I guess it could still be a cold case today. All right, let's let's move on. Uh, number four. All right, uh, this uh, next one. We were investigating Gold Hill Hotel up uh, around uh, Virginia City, Nevada. And uh, you're going to hear me uh, say, like I usually do, I began asking if anyone was present. And you'll hear me say, is there some, if there's someone here, will you make your presence known to us? And you'll hear a young child, I, I think it sounds like a young boy, saying, help me. Help me. All right, here it comes. If there's someone here, will you make your presence known to us? That was me. That was me. That was me. Man. Okay, so that was a child's voice. I'm very curious about the electronic accompaniment. What? Any idea what that was? 
No, I have no idea. It was kind of an odd sound that went with it, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you could hear it, still hear it well. I, there is nothing that bothers me more than hearing the voice of a child that's passed. And it's because, I guess we all feel, children should go immediately without passing go up to where it's good, yeah. right? And it, it just makes me question uh, why there are, why we get so many children's voices, because we never, ever have allowed children to be with us. Of course. Of course. Um, all right. All right. Let's do another one. Um, we've got so many. So um, this one, uh, you, you will hear Barry uh, talking to Roger, and, and Barry is kind of harassing Roger, <laughs> and they're talking about some movie. We can't even remember what movie he was talking about, but he says, "I think you seen that movie at the LDS Temple." That he said to Roger, and you'll hear Roger say, "They do have some good shows, though." And then a man's voice says, kill them both. Kill them both? <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. I think you've seen that movie at the LDS Temple. Are you going to have some good show in this hand? Kill them both. Kill them both. Kill them both. Huh. I, I'm not sure what that noise is. Um, I, I don't know either. Well, let's uh, actually close things up and try it again. Uh, that was, uh, I believe, uh, number five, right? Yeah. So let's see what number five does now. That's slow I think down. you've seen that movie at the obvious temple. I do have some good show in this Okay, well, that's still, unfortunately, it's very, <laughs> it's still, through all of that, it's very easy to hear. I'm wondering, uh, just let me go back very quickly and play number one uh, to see if it has that noise on it. Now, you see, that's as it should be, the cell door opening. That is exactly as it should be. So we'll see if we keep getting that noise. I, I certainly hope not. Uh, perhaps we'll move out of it, but uh, because without it, it would be a lot clearer. Yeah. Kill them yeah, both. Kill them both. Jeez. Um, all right, let's try number six just just to see if this is hanging with us. Okay. Um, and it could just be the Gold Hill Motel, or Hotel. Who knows? Yeah, that could be. <laughs> um, we were uh, in the living room area of this uh, Gold Hill Lodge. And I, you can hear me say, if you can speak, will you speak so I can hear you? And it's a child saying, Mother. Oh. All right. Here we go. If you can speak, will you speak so I can hear you? Mother. I, I don't. Mother. Mother. I, yes, Mother, but um, I just don't get that sound. And uh, we'll kind of examine uh, during a break coming up what that sound is. In in the meantime, uh, let me quickly go to Skype and uh, Israel. Hello, Israel. Yes, hello. Hi, hi. Do you have a ghost story for us? Yes, Mr. Bell. I have a uh, have a very good ghost story for you. Fire away. Okay. Let me get comfortable here and. Uh... I'm kind of nervous, so let me take a deep breath. Deep breath, yeah. <laughs> so this ghost story comes from my mother. My mother's a Pentecostal pastor. Right. She's never told a told a lie to me ever in my life, so I uh, I have to believe her on this, and it's very hard for me because I'm a very rational person, and this is a very weird story. So let me take another deep breath here. Okay. okay. <laughs> So this ghost story took place in the mid-60s. My mother was traveling around, and uh, she found herself in the capital of Honduras. I believe it's called Tegucigualpa. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was uh, traveling around with some friends. And uh, some of the friends, they worked at a, uh, at a resort, a hotel resort. This hotel resort was under renovation. 
So uh, they go there. They say, let's uh, let's stay the night here. And uh, the ones that worked there, they went ahead and stayed in their, their quarters, in the employee quarters. That was downstairs on the first floor in the kitchen area next to a, uh, a jukebox. This jukebox was un- uh, unplugged for the renovations. It was also next to a, a dining area with uh, many chairs and tables. Right. Um, my mother was staying on the third floor. She was just, just had a room there, I guess because of the renovations or w- and whatnot. And uh, on the fourth floor was staying a mother and her child. This was going to come into play. Okay. So my mother, she goes to sleep. Everybody goes to sleep. And uh, at a, I, I, I don't know what time of night, but middle of the night, my mother wakes up and she sees this dark figure above her. She says that this dark figure, excuse me here. <laughs> you have to understand, I'm kind of nervous here. I get it. No problem. So, so this dark figure above her, it's wearing a 1920s, uh, early 20th century, uh, tuxedo kind of thing. Oh. Kind of roaring 20s tuxedo kind of thing. This thing is, uh, has bold eyes, dark beard is just looking at her with hate in its eyes. It reaches down and grabs her by the throat. Okay, she can't move, she can't breathe, she can't scream. She tells me that after a while, she she just she I don't know how she got the courage and she just the power and she just r- broke free from from this thing. And she ran out of the room. I mean, uh, understandably. Yes. And she she ran downstairs, and uh, when she got downstairs, she found everybody awake. The people downstairs said. That in a, they had heard the jukebox going off. They had heard the, the tables and the chairs moving around and a lot of commotion, like if people were there. Of course, this is under renovation. There's nobody there. Sure. So, so they're, they're there. They're, of course, they're freaked out. And then all of a sudden, they start to hear the baby crying. <laughs> they run up to the fourth floor. They can't open the door. My mother tells me that the mother had, uh, left the baby in the crib had locked the door and had left for some reason. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, mother of the year, right? right. So <laughs> so they force the door open. And when they force the door open, they find the baby on the floor on a neatly laid out uh, blanket. Mm. Someone had just laid out a blanket neatly, put the baby on top of it. Yikes. Yeah, and when they when they tell the mother, the mother said, no, the baby was in the crib, I locked this door. And of course, everybody is very freaked out. <laughs> of course. So, so they all come to the agreement that they're going to sleep in the same room and they're just going to sleep out the night. See, and that sounds very rational to me. <laughs> I would too. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I mean, that, that's the end of the story, Mr. Bell. I mean, they just slept out the night in the same room and that's what happened at that, uh, that hotel. So somebody must have tenderly held or moved that child how in the world could anything like that happen it's very weird and like i said i i'm not the type of person to believe this but this comes from my mother who's never lied she's a pentecostal pastor and it's very hard for me to oh i believe you i yeah. i just don't understand or even begin to understand the forces involved and in hearing the voices of those who have passed uh, as we've been doing is Really, really creepy to me. Oh, and Mr. Bell, if I can add, uh, I remember an old show with the GIS that uh, they had the the bathtub. If you remember, oh, it I, really freaked you out. How would I ever forget that? <laughs> and that was a very good episode. The very, uh, very good show, uh, the drowning, I believe. Yes, sir. Yes, that that's what it was, and that freaked me out. That was that's why I remember it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very, very much. Does fear excite you? Welcome to Dead Air. Worldwide on the Internet, this is Midnight in the Desert with your host, Art Bell. To call the show, resolutely dial 1-952-CALL-ART. That's 1-952-225-5278. Indeed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going back to Barbara Macbeth now and more Voices of the Dead, and that really is what you're hearing. You're hearing voices of the dead, and it really becomes very, very disturbing for some people to hear this. Um, And I checked, Barbara, it looks like we're out of the bad audio territory. 
that uh, those real just real, huh? yeah those just <laughs> added on it. So number seven coming up. Uh, tell us about number seven. Uh, we this was at a mortician's home that he was having activity, and I always felt like uh, something had followed him home from work, and. You're going to hear him. We were up in uh, his son's bedroom uh, where a lot of activity was taking place. And you're going to hear the mortician say, can you see him while he's here? Can you see the lights? And you will hear a voice. And there's a, we have a dispute on what it says. Um, yeah, I've been that this it says, for years. Okay. I don't know if I want to live, and the other one says, I don't know how I'm going to live. Okay. Uh, so uh, I guess first choice would be, I don't know if I want to live. Here we go. Can you see the waves here? Can you see the lights? I don't know if I want to live. I don't know if I want to live. I don't know if I want to live. Oh, man, that's clear. Um... I don't know if I want to live. I, I think that's very clear to me. Is it? How does somebody on the other side, if that's where they are, um, I don't, you know, I mean, that's a statement, right, Barb, of somebody who yeah. is probably alive, a statement, or, or, or somebody who is very recently dead and doesn't know it yet. Or... The mind is continuing, and they want it to stop, and they're they're still, as far as they're concerned, they're still alive because their consciousness is still going. All right. Going. One more time from the other side. Can you see the waves here? Can you see the lights? No, I can't believe it. No, I can't believe it. No, I can't believe it. Totally creepy, Barbara. I don't know if I want to live. <laughs> I don't know if I want to hear that one again. Um, I want to emphasize to everybody that your organization is pristine, as are you, Barbara, uh, ethically, um, in every way you can imagine. This is the real McCoy you're hearing. Uh, these people have done a fabulous job with thousands upon th thousands of hours of work. Think what you will of what you're hearing, but there's nobody around making these sounds. There's no fakery about what you hear going on. Number eight. On this one, uh, this was t uh, recorded at an uh, Indian school uh, where they would take children, Indian children, American Indian children, off the reservations and bring them to this school, and this is where they would live also. And uh, we were there at this location. There is no uh, other voice that you'll hear. It's just the EVP, and it. It sounds like it says, I don't want to come. I don't want to come back. Okay, I don't want to come or I don't want to come back. Listen carefully, everybody. Moly, holy moly, Barbara! So um, obviously a lot of hum in that one, but also obviously very easy to hear. I don't want to come. I don't want to come back. That's exactly what I hear. Now maybe that is suggestion, um, maybe not. But it sounded extremely clear to me. The hum was the only it problem with it. Very sad. Very but, sad. Yeah, I don't want to come back. I don't want to come. I don't want to come back, which could mean, I don't know. Do you, after you get these, Barb, uh, particularly these disturbing ones, do you um, try and analyze what they might have meant? Well, it could mean so many things. To me, <laughs> the, the Indian school wasn't a very happy place for those Indian children to be. They weren't allowed to speak their native tongue. They had to speak English. Uh, they couldn't uh, practice even their religion at this this location. So it was a very sad place. Okay. Um, 
How do you maintain your composure, uh, Barbara? When I guess you've done it for years, but still in all, hearing this stuff puts a big chill down my spine. So how do you maintain composure? Well, it's something that um, I, I have never been afraid of this. I, just my upbringing, I'm very used to this kind of thing. The, the thing that's different is the technology that is allowing me to be able to hear oh, yeah. the things that uh, that I'm able, you know, that able to record. Sure. Okay, let's but, go on. Uh, let's go on. Number nine. Um, this one is Brendan. You'll. Uh, this was at the mausoleum at a mausoleum, and you'll hear Brendan say, hello, is anyone here? And this EVP was recorded, it's cold, it's cold. Hmm. Yeah, cold. Here we go. Hello, is anyone here? That is too clear. Uh, that's either a child, I'm guessing, or a very young, I think young child, I mean, maybe 12. That's what I think. Something I think like it's a young child. So what do we conclude, uh, Barbara, I ask you for the 10 millionth time, from hearing these children talk from the other side? Um, it just, It just... Doesn't make sense, Barb. No, it doesn't, and I can't. Uh, I can't give you an answer. I don't know. They shouldn't be there. I'd be, I'd be lying if I said I. Knew. Yeah, they shouldn't be there. That's, that's what no, I would they say. They, 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 ought they, they not. should not be there. Okay. All right. Hold tight for a minute, Barb. Let's try a ghost story from Skype. These have to be good ones. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi again. Um, I just want to start. I'm from East Hampton, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, I just want to start by saying that I have had lucid dreams before, and I have never had sleep paralysis, and what I'm about to say is none of these things. Okay. Um, I was uh, about seven or eight, and I was sent to bed early I was being a bad kid as I did at that time <laughs> and I was sent to my room so I took a while to get to sleep but when I did around 9, 9.30 uh, I was woken up by a woman screaming wonderful it was not my mother uh, my grandmother had passed away at the time and she was screaming at me and saying, come out here. Hmm. And I, as a foolish child, I decided to go out into the hallway. And in the hallway, sitting on a rocking chair that was not there before, I saw an old black woman. Good Lord. And this old black woman began to yell at me, telling me how I had let my family down, telling me how I was a bad person and I maybe lasted four seconds out in that hallway before I ran and back into my bedroom. Yeah, and okay. Well, you bed. know what? My first reaction would have been not to run out into the hall where the screaming was, but to go under the covers where uh, perceived safety was. As a seven-year-old, I must have thought that you were being Whatever ordered. happened to me, I'm safe because my parents were in the hallway right across the way. Aye. Wow. Okay, well, I, I don't know what to say about that, except you were one brave little seven-year-old. I'm much less brave now hmm. than then. I take, it, I take it uh, that eventually this older black lady was just suddenly gone? Yeah, never again any haunting things in my 
my house. Uh, my mom used to say that my godmother was there when a wine glass broke, but I never felt the same feeling of this woman since that one time. I'm sure you're not looking forward to it again. So, listen, thank you very, very much for the call. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the uh, the brevity and the particularly scary nature of the call.